Hey guys, and welcome to this episode of the Rose Reviews. My name is Adam Rose, and today we're going to be talking about Kubo and the two strings. And I'm actually joined here today with a good friend of mine, Mr. Chris Hecke. Chris, how are you doing? Hey, man, I'm doing really good. Uh, went and saw this uh, movie with you tonight, and uh, looking forward uh, to our discussion. Yes, that we did, that we did. Uh, it's th- Thursday night, so it's August 18th, 2016. So we actually got to see this opening night. Um, at our local theater. Um, so before we get started, I just want to say, one, thank you for listening. And if you like any of this part of this podcast today, if you could do me a favor and leave a review on iTunes, it'll be a separate section called Ratings and Reviews. You can leave a star review or a written review. That would be uh, very helpful to me and mean a great deal. So let's talk about this movie. So before we talk about our overall thoughts or anything like that, let's just talk about before any of that. So before we saw the movie, what were our, what were your feelings going into the film? Did you know much about it? And what were you were you excited? Were you not excited? Were you neutral? How did you feel going into this film? So my expectations were uh, not a lot. I'd seen the preview, maybe uh, like the hint of, a, of a, an early teaser last year, a trailer a couple of weeks ago, and then our short conversation where uh, I found out it was uh, stop motion. Mm-hmm. Animated, so th- those are my expectations. Just okay. I watched the preview. Did you, you like it? The preview? Yeah, it, it intrigued me enough to want to watch this tonight more than some of our other options. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Okay, all right. So overall, excitement level was like, oh, cool. I'm, 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 I'm interested. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of anything that represents uh, like. Uh, myths or um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. any kind of uh, mythology, legend, fable kind of a thing is, is really exciting, uh, especially when it, you see a dude with a sword and something right. that looks like a samurai's tail. Or uh, yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, so the the geek in me was excited, was ready, yeah, awesome, I was ready. And for me, I'm a big fan of Leica Animation. They've done films such as Paranorman, Coraline. Box Trolls most recently, and now this, Kubo and the Two Strings. And so if you don't know it, they do stop animation, meaning that they have actual physical props there. And what they do is they basically set these props up in a certain position, the frame that they want for the camera. They basically record that frame, and then they every time they move a character or a character moves a hand or something moves, they actually are recording another frame. Um, so... They, if you can just imagine the amount of effort and time and talent that that takes to do that, you can appreciate, I think, these films maybe even a little bit more, which we'll, we'll get into. It's kind of the same idea if you compare it to a flipbook. Yeah. Right? Like if it's, yeah, it's, it's like just a, a bunch of like different small adjustments every time, and then you superimpose all of them, and you create mm-hmm. this idea of movement. So it's kind of stilted, but yet beautiful in a way, because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's got movement uh, uh, to the movement. Exactly. So these are like really intricate uh, flipbooks. Basically, yeah. um, so I was excited for this project. Um, I had heard the voice talent in it. I, I had heard the, actually the CEO of Leica is the director of this film, which I thought made it very interesting. He had done a lot of art direction and other films. He's been in animation for over twenty years, so it's not like he's new to this by any means. But this was his first directorial debut. Excited about that. I'm always excited for Leica's next project that they're doing so overall excitement was it was i knew it was talented i had seen one of the trailers didn't know how i felt about it thought it looked interesting didn't want to know much more and uh thought you know what let's go do a review for this film because Leica is always worth going to check out if you haven't seen any of the other films i would highly recommend you go check those out because they are worth your time just alone on pure animation pure talent and just rep- you know uh, appreciating these people's time that they put into these awesome films so now we'll give kind of our overall thoughts of what we thought about for this film. So overall thoughts coming out of the theater, Chris, what did what were your overall general thoughts of the film? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so about, you know, uh, uh, I, I was kind of like letting myself be really critical of the whole thing because I knew we were going to talk about <laughs> it. And I wanted to make sure that I had things to talk about or at least uh, things to anchor into my arguments. But about, I want to say maybe a third of the way through, I kind of threw everything out and just the nerd in me was geeking out a little mm-hmm, bit. Like mm-hmm. there were some uh, cool scenes and some, some really beautiful things that drew my eye in and some uh, incredible animation. And so all of a sudden I just like, I put everything out the window and I just geeked out and that's how it was until the end. It was uh, geekfulness and uh, excitement. So I walked out like really like, oh man, I have to tell people about this. 
So you really liked it? Yeah. 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 Coming out. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to agree with you for the most part. I this this is the best. This is the best animation I've seen. This is the best animated thing I've seen all year. It's honestly in the top five best things I've seen, films I've seen all year. Whoa. And yeah, I mean, it's it was granted we haven't had a great year for film, but I think I really really liked what this story had to say. Um, I my overall general thoughts are I really really enjoyed it. Borderline loved it. Um, I think it's a beautiful film. I think the story was beautiful. I thought the animation itself was fantastic. I thought the voice talent was awesome to hear, and it made me smile several times. Um, overall, I thought it was a great story to tell. I do have a couple little problems with it, um, but I did still really enjoy it. It's not a perfect film by any means, but it is very enjoyable for sure. So let me give you the synopsis um, for this film or a little uh, blurb here. Again, it was directed by Travis Knight. The blurb is, uh, the synopsis is, a young boy named Kubo must locate a magical suit of armor worn by his late father in order to defeat a vengeful spirit from the past. This is 141 minutes, so it's about, I'm sorry, it's 101 minutes, so it's a little over 90 minutes, so a little over um, to some yeah, some regular animation hour films. 40. It's, <laughs> sorry, hour 40. <laughs> uh, yes, hour 40, yeah, 101 minutes. Um, this does have right now, before we get into the specifics, this has a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes, meaning about almost 9 out of 10 critics are coming out really liking it. Almost 9.5 out of 5 critics, or 10 Whoa. out of critics really You can cut a it. critic in 0.5? You can, half a person. Whoa, Kubo! <laughs> uh, 93% on audience wanting to see it, so a level of excitement for audience is, is actually very high. So this is doing really well critically. Um, and I can, after seeing the film, I can, I can see why. I mean, there's, it's, it's hard, not, it's hard to come out. I feel like it's almost impossible, or not impossible, very unlikely. Someone's going to come out of this film and say, "That was awful," and I didn't enjoy anything about it. It's like, I feel like this is one of those films that, like, maybe okay, if you don't love the story, there's some characters that might be great, or enjoy the animation. I mean, there's something in here, here for everyone to like. I think. I, I want to pep in. I think this film delivers. I think that's the thing. It just, it 100% delivers. Uh, what it's promising, and I think that it's something you mentioned in your uh, opinion of where, when you came out, is how beautiful it is. There's something that just was a unique cinematic experience of seeing these gorgeous colors. It was almost like reading a really cool flip book or something that artistically drew me in. And then when you mix that with a sense of adventure and the like youthful humor in it, mix all of that together with like an ending that is heartfelt and uh, you know, poignant and, and making a really kind of nice statement. Uh, it's like, yeah, you can't help but walk, t walk out uplifted, which is what I think an animation should do is you should feel kind of ebullient, mm -hmm. uh, or not ebullient might be the wrong word, but you should float buoyant. Right. Is right. What I meant to say. And, uh, part of me agrees with that. I mean, I agree with what you're saying, but what I liked about this film and what it did, which we'll talk about the director in a second, but what I liked was, this movie was not afraid to be honest with its viewers. Uh, I don't. I'm not. Again, this is spoiler free, so I'm not going to tell you what I'm talking about specifically. But I feel like I don't need to to get my point across. In that, it's not spoon feeding you a whole lot. It's assuming the viewer. I feel is very smart, which I sometimes see animation not do. Um, I saw Secret Life of Pets earlier this year, and that was one of my big problems with it. I don't want to spend you know a whole podcast talking about it, but. I just want to use it as a comparison. I felt like it dumbed down a lot of concepts and kind of made acted like the viewer was dumb. Simplified things. Simplified things. And I feel like Kubo doesn't do that. It doesn't really spoon feed it to the audience. Also, uh, the subject matter and how it ends in particular is not your typical Disney happy ending. Everyone you know gets out of there and everyone's doing great. You know, It doesn't end like that. And it doesn't, I thought, it, and we'll talk about this in a second, but there's actually one part in the movie where I was like, surely that's not, surely that's not really what's going to happen, right? That's, he, you know, he or she, it's not, you know. And then, no, they, they, that's, they really did it. And so, like, they do, they make some really interesting decisions. Um, the, 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 they're, they're unapologetic. Unapologetic, yeah. exactly, and like, which, is, which is great. It's, it's it, I, think, I think it shows ownership over their craft. 
mm-hmm. um, to me that was they were saying like here's here's what it is like uh, something you said just uh, struck a chord with me where they were not going to apologize for what they were doing uh, in a good way because it made me ask questions mm-hmm. like what what is the meaning what is going on I still yeah. not sure about some things and that really drew me in so that's uh, uh, was really good on their part yeah and from the very beginning it it, it was. It was pretty unapologetic, which I really liked. Um, so let's talk about the director, Travis Knight. Again, this is his first directorial debut, but again, he is the CEO of Leica, which is the company that do, does all these stop animation films. Um, he has done a lot of the art direction with a lot of the other stuff, but he loved this story so much from an interview that I heard that he wanted to direct this one and um, got the job. So in regards to his direction, in regards to his vision, because, you know, the director in regards to film is kind of like uh, the collector of all the other people's talents, right? And all the other people do the work, right? And it, but it's his vision. He's guiding all these other people to do the best work that they can in regards to the actors, in regards to the art department, in regards to the, um, the you know cinematographer, all these different positions. It's his vision, and they're just kind of unif- trying to be unified in that vision. So in regards to the vision for this film and how it visually looked, how he got the talent out of the actors, the voice casting, all those things. I really, those aren't really the big things except for one part with the script, which he did not write, so we won't get to that right now. Um, Visually, I had no problems. I thought the animation was top-notch, top-notch with what Leica's been doing. I thought the voice talent was fantastic, which again, we'll get specifically, but I thought overall very good. Um, I enjoyed that, and you know, his vision of what this film and the story he was trying to tell came across very clearly to me and the edit it was very well edited i didn't i thought it was smooth throughout pretty good pace i mean overall i think he did a really good job with this film for a first time director i think this shows a lot of promise a couple script issues but overall i think he did a really great job for a first time director with this kind of complex material for for kids chris what did you think of this first time director travis knight I, I agree with most of what you said. I'll reiterate it. Uh, the, I, I did have... I, I'm not sure if you're talking about the same thing, and I know we won't spoil anything, but I, I do... I had a f- couple questions, uh, and I didn't know if there were script issues or uh, art directions and, and questions in a bad way, meaning I'm not sure what they were trying to do. Um, but yeah, overall, I think um, in terms of the way he gives us the story, which I think is, is also part of the director's job, the way he gives us the story... Really nice, flowed. I I, uh, I could follow. I could uh, you know have those ups and downs, lose myself, and um, so the t- storytelling is, I think, uh, really really good job by him. And I'll add that to everything you said. Very well done. Yeah. So now let's talk about the script itself. Without spoilers, of course, we'll talk about what we thought about the script. So, um, Chris, go ahead. What were your thoughts on the story, the script, and uh, where? Kubo and the Two Strings took us. Um, I one one thing that threw me that wasn't uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it was necessary, but I had a hard time knowing where we were. I knew when we were, but some of the cuts were so abrupt to me that I I didn't understand if there was an idea of time lapse time mm-hmm. travel and sometimes it was done intentionally and artistically and that was like no i know what you flip mean. of a page but at other times it was just a little jilting because i thought uh-huh. oh all of a sudden we're in a completely new place um so that was kind of I, and again i don't know if that's the writing of it that was part of that or uh director's yeah, choice ar- artistic to director right yeah um i would have to say i agree with those that my main two problems with this film is the villain, once you figure out the villain's motivations towards the end of the film, felt like it was a little sloppy and I still didn't fully understand what the purpose was. Um, I thought it was a little loose, um, didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, when I try and think about it logically, I'm like, wait, so this, 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 then what? You know? So it made me question it a little bit. The other thing is, and I, I like this, I, but I also hate it. I like it and I hate it. All right. Yeah. I. Don't at the beginning of the film, I was never sure what was real and what was not real. And then once we hit into which you've seen the trailer, so this is not a spoiler, we hit into where the monkey and the beetle are around. I felt like the transition from real life and nothing, everything is kind of real 
to like or meta to monkeys and beetles i was like wait what so now yeah i thought the rules of this world were this and now they're this mm, and so i found that yeah, little yeah yeah great point yeah i found that a little jarring um and they don't really want to explain it well let me let me offer a counter to that it, sure. it might be that might be our lack of understanding of japanese myth yeah, but I feel like because a general audience shouldn't have to know that to feel like they understand your film. No, right, but they shouldn't have to know that, but that that doesn't mean that the film is trying to be accurate in that culture, yeah, then yeah. If, then we may not know that those are the rules. I mean, I agree with your point, but I'm contending you here because most of the times you've got your vanilla friends on your podcast <laughs> who refuse to argue with you, so I'm going yeah, yeah. to argue against you, and I'm going to also take it back a little bit so I don't burst your mic. No, no, but, you're good. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. Maybe Maybe that's... That's why that is. It's, it could be a cultural, a cultural thing, thing, and maybe yeah. the, the myth could include all things, and you just don't know it at the top. True. Which maybe you should, but yeah. I'll just but say did that. you? But do you know what I mean, though? Did you? Feel yeah. Oh, that yeah. At all? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Like like the rules were suddenly broken because animals could appear and talk yeah. to you as opposed to first, just humans. Yeah. The first and like dreams. fifteen minutes, which I was also yeah. surprised. It didn't bother me once the movie got going, but I was surprised. It took us a while to get to the actual adventure with Beetle and Monkey and everything. It I, took I a, like that. I felt like it, it did. took a it while. It took a while, but I liked it because it really just it set it up the exposition part, right? It just set it up. Yeah. Um, which, again, this is part of me thinking this movie was unapologetic in that they were going to have us go through this thing and take us through a long exposition and just let us hang because mm-hmm. the payoff was coming. I was going to say, so it's like, that's the so thing. is Everything that happens it. in those first 15 minutes pays off later. Yeah, I would, I would that, it was a great. There's a great callback uh, in this movie. I think that it, it does. It kind of wraps a lot of bows really yeah, nicely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great callback moments. A lot. Um, so overall, we like the director's script. We had a couple issues, mm-hmm. um, but overall, was that your? Do you? What did you think about the villain problem that I mentioned? Yeah, do you I see what I'm talking uh, about. I do, but <laughs> with, I, I would like to discuss it, but I don't know how we're going to do that spoiler free. Yeah, so, yeah. So there's there's a question about that. If you'd like to, to hit us up, I'm at Chris Heckey on Twitter, <laughs> and you can hit me up and we can have a discussion about uh, the, the logistics of the, the, the villain's, villain's motivation, because I see what you're saying, so let's, let's discuss what, I, what we thought. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe after this. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, but overall, villain for me was, his motivations were a little up in the air. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I you thought, want to discuss that, you got to hit you clear. up on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. At the at Rose Reviews, at the Rose Reviews. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, or Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now let's talk about the voice talent. Mm. So, um, just the talent of the actors in regards to their playing their characters with their voice. I would always suggest voice actors don't always get the same recognition that physical actors do, and I think that's kind of a shame because. Trust me, I've watched enough animation to know there are good voice actors and there are bad voice actors, just like there's good physical actors when they're actually in the space. And it's it's not as easy as just talking into a mic and playing, you know, making silly voices. You know, it's a lot of you it's a lot of pretty much the same thing as a regular actor. It's just maybe you're not physically there, so you don't have to like hit blocking and all that types of things, but your character does. And in regards to acting, in my perspective, learning character and back development, it's just as important. So with all that being said, I thought the voice talent did a great job. I really did. I thought Matthew McConaughey, this is his first you know, voiceover work, and I thought he did a really great job um, for a first-time voice actor and got a lot of the um, mannerisms of the character and I felt like he fit the character well but again that's art development more than it is his voice but I thought overall oh, oh you're gonna you're gonna have me fighting you on this <laughs> I, I, I just gave him a look for for those of you not watching <laughs> this and only listening I just gave him this look I so I have an acting background as you know I, I think uh, there's so much to the voice that we don't realize we're watching when we watch animation, and I actually have a beef mm-hmm. against some animators about this. And I'll take you back to, uh, I can take you back to uh, uh, watching uh, Finding Nemo. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I have a big issue against animators when they, I feel like that, like they don't match the voice. Well, I think that they don't trust the actors that have to do this incredible work to get the voice right. They still don't trust their acting sometimes, mm. um, and someday I'll tell you the story, and then you can decide if okay. you want to bring me back and tell. Sure, story. but I agree with you. I think the voice animation was great. I, I'm still on the fence on your boy, Maddie Mac. Because, okay, was that the only one you had a problem with? No. I, so there was something that happened to me because I really was listening to the voices, particularly as uh-huh. an actor myself. 
I was paying attention to the voices and that revealed something to me very early when I realized what the actors were doing. It revealed two characters that I recognized by the voice Mm -hmm. and that kind of didn't spoil, but I discovered something that I, as a film goer, wasn't supposed to discover. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. So, right. So then, uh, so when that happened, I thought, I don't know if it's the character's voice is just so recognizable that I now see what's going on, you know, or, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can recognize Matthew McConaughey's character because he kind of has that drawl and he did a great job with the voice, but I still thought sometimes, oh, I kept thinking that's, I keep seeing Matthew McConaughey's face on a character (laughs) and then that also to me meant, oh, well, this must be this, this thing. Right. Um, Um, so I don't, I don't know. Did you like Charlize as the monkey? A lot. Okay. A lot. George and George uh, George Takei. George Takei. I Takei. <laughs> George Takei. I recognized immediately and kind of giggled to myself. Yeah. Because it's uh, he's he's they kind of they kind of put him in a stereotype right there. They're like, oh, we want this person to sound like the Asian guy, yeah. the Asian George Takei, um, uh, which is horribly terrible of us to say, but it's true. You know, someone in this film that I guarantee you is going to get overlooked is Rooney Mara, who plays the sisters. Mm. I, thought yeah, I was surprised when I saw her name. I thought she yeah. did a great job. She plays the, the sisters. I'm not going to give you any spoilers here, but she plays the sisters. And those are really interesting characters. And I thought she did a great job with their voices. Mm-hmm. A lot of emotions. Because this is a really complex relationship. And I understood the relationship and how these sisters felt. And so I thought she did a really, really great job that I think yeah. might get overlooked. And someone who's, who uh, is maybe not as surprising, but it was a nice surprise to know, is Ray Fiennes. Yeah, Ralph Fiennes does, is the... Uh, Ralph Moon Fiennes, whoops. Moon King. No, uh, yeah, right, Moon right. King, yeah. Right, uh, mm-hmm. does the Moon King, um, but sounds just as... How do I... You know, just sounds just as slithery as, as he yeah. should. That, yeah. the, the Moon King should sound slithery and... Uh-huh. and uh, Ralph Fiennes sure did that. So that was it. Was kind of like, oh well, of course. When I saw his name in the credits, yeah. But overall, did you? I, overall, I had the, it wasn't too distracting. The voice cast wasn't distracting for me. A delight. Uh, a delight. A delight. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was enjoyable for for majority. I see your point for sure. I get that. Um, but again, didn't take too much away from me. Um, so now let's just talk about. Overall general thoughts, recommendations, things like that. Any else? Any other points you want to make? Uh, well, I have I have two more things. I'll I'll wrap it up, and then I'll, I I want to have a, an argument. A, a let's say a loving discussion with sure, you about, sure. about something uh, regarding the Rose reviews. Um, sure. No uh, final recommendations. Um, take take your kids to it. Uh, to go with your family. It's it's a a true family film. Um, it's got some uh, really cool pictures. Um, I think, to be honest, when you experience a film, I think it's nice to be able to generate discussion among people. And I think if you take kids or have kids or, or go with a, a group of people who you can have good conversations with, you could talk about some things that this, some themes this movie brings brings up, um, and as well as just enjoy it and, and delight in the the beauty of some of the pictures created with the scenery and stuff. So. Highly recommended. Uh, might go again uh, if you're taking someone special. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. Before I give you my, uh, my other point of discussion. Sure. Um, yeah, I would say. No, I was. I'm curious to see your opinion on this because I was thinking about this as well. I don't know. I have a little niece. She's three. I was like, I don't know if I'd want to bring her to this. Um, I think there's a couple scary-ish. Thing. I think yeah, for me, yeah, I, I would say depending on yeah, I would say right. five, six, maybe mm-hmm. six. Well, here yeah, this it also a, depends on the here's kid. Here's a spoiler that I can reveal because it doesn't ruin anything. The hero is eleven, yeah. so maybe start there. <laughs> start, yeah, yeah. Start with your kids around. Like, but you, you know what I mean? No, like, to, there, there's right. some darker themes and there's some yes. scarier moments. I think little little kids may not. Yeah, I mean it's need still to see. G-rated, so. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah. Don't take a three-year-old, no. five-year-old. I mean, like, I can take her to Finding Dory, and it's fine, but this is a little more, not adult, but I would say it's a little more mature, uh, mm-hmm. different subject matter for sure. So I would say, you know, you know your kid, you know, better than I do or, you know, whatever, but my recommendation is, you know, w- wait until they're a little older 
and you know your kids, so you'll be able to tell. But there are a couple scary-ish type things, and there are some material here that I think is a little more mature um, well, that, for kids. Well, that, and that's what I was thinking what you could start a discussion with. It might be a good time to talk to your kids about. Yeah, about a couple the things, things. The things you're going to see that are, it's a real thing you do. Okay, can we just say what it is? This is not... A death? Yeah. Yeah, death, yeah, yeah. Death, death is a you're, real You're going to have conversations about... Right. We're tiptoeing around this thing. No, Come no, on, no. Death, death is a theme death. in this, for sure. Um, death is a theme. Forgiveness is a theme. Mm. Um, I would say... Uh, memories. Memories. So there's a lot of cool themes in this. Um, but yeah, death is definitely one of those things. Love um, are one of these these themes in this film which yeah. I really enjoyed so my overall recommendation is if you like Laika if you like Laika you like Aww, this animation you're, clever. you're so clever <laughs> if you like this animation <laughs> style if you enjoy these films I think this will honestly in my opinion this is one of their best ones it, it, it's I really really enjoyed Coraline so it's right up there with Coraline with me but I would really recommend this film. These guys don't make enough money for the effort that they put in tor- towards it. Um, so I would really recommend you go out and see this film. I think you'll really enjoy it. It's a great Japanese story. It has a lot to say, like Chris said, about memories, about love, about death, about forgiveness, about these things um, that are awesome to talk about. You know, when an animated film, you can get out of it and, like Chris said, have questions. And not just say, you know, like I saw Minions earlier this last year, I think, and I was so disappointed because it was just, it wasn't, made, didn't make you think, it didn't provide anything, you know, this is the other problem I had with Secret Life of Pets, but it didn't really make you think about a whole lot. Unlike this where it's like, wow, these are some and really interesting life questions to think about and look at them in a different new cultural way. So we're going to score this thing on a score of 0 to 5, 0 being a thorn, 5 being a rose. I know it's hard to give scores. Three is fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, which means you liked it. Uh, Chris, do you have a score? Yes, I have a score. <laughs> a score of moments where I've been wanting to talk to you about your scoring system on this podcast, okay. my friend. Let's talk about Listen, it. Listen, I polled some of your 220 listeners. Okay. And over 50% of them, which is a number I made up, <laughs> don't understand why you say it's out of five, but then you've used... I've I've listened to all all of your podcasts, save one that I was okay. waiting for. Okay. The Suicide Squad review. Yeah. And you have at times going as far as to put two decimal points after <laughs> your score. So you you got to change that. If you're gonna if you're gonna put decimal points, you got to make it out of ten. If you're gonna put second decimal points, just make it out of a hundred. Because what's the difference of going right. five? So the people have spoken. The people right, that one, I two. made up about this poll have spoken. Stick to at least one decimal. All right, one Just decimal. Let's, let's I'll, do one. I'll do one decimal 4. for today. 4.27. Come on, like what is what is that? How, <laughs> how can you cut a rose that many times? No, I'll, let's I'll do one. To, I'll do point. Which score point with point one. No, what? What do you? I mean, not point one five. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah point, five. Point, yeah, five yeah, yeah point five or nothing. It has to be like odds. Got it. That makes sense. There's All a right. first betting reference in your entire. <laughs> <laughs> Zero out of five. What would you say for this film? I'm gonna give it a four. Because okay, I respect, wow. I respect fives, right? <laughs> I respect for like five. It has to be, and I'm an I'm an adult. I'm a thirty year old. It, it has to be something more than just delightful. Um, yeah, it has to be challenging and yeah, vibrant, right, and right, something right. crazy and new. Um, and but you know, four is still a really good score. Yeah, a, a four point five. Um, you know, I would say is some something great, but then there's one issue with it. So I'm just gonna lower this one a little bit more because it's an animated. Yeah. Um, that's just kind of where I see it now. My rose, my my rose. Not I'm not talking to you. I'm just saying my <laughs> rose. Yes. Um, is set right now to, like I'm gonna introduce colors. All right. So there's okay. white, yellow, pink, red, and then black. Oh, or okay. something like that. Right. So that's for like G, PG, like because oh, if okay. I know I'm going into an animated film, like I'm not gonna expect to see like five black roses for like the most beautiful perfect dark and right, know, r-rated thing right. so i'm gonna just dial that meter back so i'm somewhere between a yellow and a white rose so it's like oh it's a children's movie it's fun delight in light of that that's my 4-0 i know it seems high for other uh uh reviews no, grades no, no given but 
I mean, that's I, where I land. I'm pretty much on the same boat with you, to be honest with you. Again, I really enjoyed this film. I would recommend this film. It's a beautiful film in every regard, in regards mm-hmm. to the story, the characters, the yeah. animation. That's one word, if I was to describe this film, is beautiful. I think your word might be delightful. Delightful. Yeah. Delightful. Be- beautiful and delightful is what this film is. I'm going to have to give it a four out of five. Ooh. Again, I really enjoyed this film. I think it's a beautiful film. Please go support these guys if you like this type of filmmaking, these beautiful stories, original ideas. Hey, a lot of people are starting school soon. One last hurrah. One last hurrah. This is a (laughs) great way to go out. I promise you, you all want to talk about it and have questions and discussions. And it'll make you think and it'll make you enjoy film a little bit more. Yeah. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Thank you. Thank you for letting me challenge you. Of course. Thank you for uh, talking, and thank you for listening. And until next time, I'll see you at the movies. Bye-bye. Peace.